welcome uh, to the November Q&A session on the kidney. The, the purpose of these talks is to uh, have an outreach to people in the community uh, who might have questions about kidney disease, um, to give an overview of the kidney, how it works in the normal situation, uh, and then how we as doctors test for abnormal kidney function, and then some of the things that we do uh, when the kidney doesn't work normally. Uh, and so we'll do a little bit of that, review some of that, and then I'd be happy to take uh, questions at the end that uh, people might have. So welcome to tonight's session. Um, this first slide um, is just a cut through picture of the abdomen showing the two kidneys here. This is one kidney, this is the other kidney. On top of the kidneys is another organ called the adrenal glands. So this is the part of the body that makes cortisol. Um, the kidneys weigh about a third of a pound each. And you can't tell from this picture, but they're in the back uh, of the abdomen, not, not the front. This slide is a very important slide because it shows that the kidney function does not uh, stay constant as you get older and older. It's like your eyesight gets worse, uh, your hearing gets worse. The same thing occurs with kidney function. Now, the kidney does many, many things. And so the function that we're talking about here uh, is actually um, the filtration ability of the kidney. The kidney filters, it does many, many different things, but one of its important functions is to filter blood. And the amount of fluid that's filtered every day is about 120 to 140 liters a day. That's approximately 72 liter Coke bottles. Each Imagine what a two liter Coke bottle looks like. That's two liters. If we filter 140 liters a day, that's 70 of those. That's how much fluid actually comes through a normal kidney every day. Now, most of that fluid is absorbed. So we only urinate out about a liter a day. Um, but that ability to filter the blood declines with age normally. And so you can see in a 70 year old, uh, there's 80% of the kidney function is left. The patient may only be filtering 100 or 110 liters a day. Now, the important point is that when that 70 year old goes to the doctor, most doctors don't know that the kidney function normally declines. And so when they see that the function is 80% of normal, they will call that kidney disease even though it's not. So when you go to the doctor, you always have, if you're in your 70s, 80s, or 90s, you always have to make sure that your kidney function is what is expected for your age. And if it is, you have nothing wrong with your kidneys. That's just normality. You would only be diagnosed as having a kidney problem if the function, and specifically the filtration function, is less than it is for your age. And men and women decline at different rates. The men are in uh, red here, the women are in, in uh, blue. And I'll talk about how the doctor assesses your kidney function and specifically the filtration ability of your kidney in a few slides. Now, if the filtration is abnormal, then your doctor will tell you you have CKD. And CKD stands for chronic kidney disease. And what evolved over the last 20 years or so or more are to call the different levels of function different CKD stages. So for instance, if you have CKD stage one, you have very minor changes in your kidney function. It's still over 90% of normal. Whereas if you're CKD stage five, you have a severe decline in your kidney function and you're getting near where you might need a, cat, a transplant or dialysis. And so the doctor will tell you, or you'll get in the lab report, what CKD stage you're at. All it represents is a different level of your the ability of your kidney to filter. Now, as I said, uh, if you're 70 or 80 and your filtration rate is about 90% of normal. Unfortunately, many doctors will say you have CKD stage one. But in fact, you have no CKD at all. That's just normality. 
Whereas if you had 90% of normal and you were 15 years old, that there is something wrong with your kidney. You do have CKD stage one. So just be aware of that and always compare what you have to what you should have for your age. Again, it's not widely recognized. Yep. Now, kidney disease causes many problems, some of which you might predict because of the function of the kidney, but some of it is not uh, predicted. For instance, the kidney gets rid of salt and water, so you might guess that if the kidney is not working properly, you're going to have fluid overload, and the fluid tends to go because of gravity into the feet. Uh, so at the end of the day, your feet are swollen. In the morning, they tend to be okay because during the night when you're lying flat, the fluid goes back into your body and your feet aren't swollen. But towards the end of the day, they tend to swell. And you can tell because they look swollen or your shoes don't fit as well. Another feeling people get with severe kidney disease, they lose their appetite and they're nauseous. Uh, this is because of some of the chemicals that build up in the blood when you get severe kidney disease. You can get high blood pressure from kidney disease, again, because the fluid that is retained is retained in your blood vessels, and therefore the pressure in your blood vessels goes up. And when we're measuring blood pressure, we're actually measuring the pressure inside your blood vessels. The kidney controls a lot of the chemistry of blood, and these refer to different chemicals that are what Na is sodium or salt, K is potassium, Ca is calcium that you get from Tums, Mg is magnesium, P is phosphorus. This is bicarbonate or what's in baking soda. The kidney controls the blood levels of all these things. And so when the kidney doesn't work properly, the doctor will have potentially uh, abnormal blood tests that um, these refer to. The kidney also determines how much blood you have, how much, and specifically the number of red blood cells you have uh, in your blood. And if the kidney is not working properly, you can get anemic. People with severe kidney disease can also get depressed. And it isn't just because they have a disease. It's thought perhaps there are chemicals that are retained that might predisposed to depression. It's not really well understood. People with kidney disease can also have sleep disturbance. So in addition to the fact that as you get older, you keep waking up more and more at night, you know, like the average 83 or 84 year olds getting up four times a night. This is in addition to that. Um, and you may actually sleep during the day more often than you would for your age. And not only does the patient sometimes feel nauseous and have a lack of appetite, but when they do eat, the food tastes abnormal. It just doesn't taste the same. It, and oftentimes it's bland. Um, and that's also an, a, a cause of why these patient, patients don't eat as well. Not only do they have a lack of appetite, but the food doesn't taste good. So how does the doctor test for kidney disease? We have a measurement in the, in, that's part of the routine uh, blood tests that we call creatinine. And this is in all routine blood work. There's thousands of creatinines measured every day at UCLA. Uh, the normal level is around one. Creatinine is a substance that's made in your muscles. So when you eat meat or fish, which, which is really a muscle, when you're eating meat, you're eating a muscle. When you eat fish, you're eating a muscle. There's creatinine in those foods. So your creatinine comes from your own muscles also, and it's made roughly the same amount is made from your muscles every day, unless you lose muscles because you're not going to the gym or you're um, losing your muscle bulk for whatever reason. And also the converse, more will be made if you bulk up. The reason we use this for a kidney test is because the kidney is responsible for getting rid of this. So the muscle makes it, and the kidney gets rid of it. And the normal levels around one. If your kidney function declines to half of normal, the creatinine will double. So that's sort of the concept. And we can tell that you have half of your kidney function because your creatinine went from one to two. If your creatinine went from one to four, you have a quarter of your kidney function. Now, again, I'm referring to how much water 
goes through the kidneys every day. So as I was saying before, normally you have about 140 liters going through, which would be reflected by a creatinine of one. If your creatinine in your blood goes to two, you have about 70 liters going through. If your creatinine goes to four, you have a quarter of 140, et cetera, et cetera. When the kidney function gets down to about 15% of normal, and you can do the math, you can take 15% of 140, then you start needing uh, renal replacement therapy like dialysis or a transplant. So this is a very common test and it's nice. We don't have, a, we don't have to measure how much fluid is coming through the kidney. We just measure this number in the blood test. Now, in addition to this number, you'll also see something else that the doctor might've told you about, or you'll see it in your electronic medical record called EGFR, E capital G, capital F, capital R. And E refers to estimated. And I'll talk to you about why it's estimated in a minute. And GFR is an acronym for glomerular filtration rate. Glomerular filtration rate is just a fancy way of saying what we just talked about, how much fluid is coming through the kidneys. So uh, your normal glomerular filtration rate would be about 120 or 140 when you're 40 years old or 50 years old. The reason we have an E in front of it is because the doctors do not measure it. What they do is measure the creatinine. Then they put the creatinine into a mathematical formula and the formula predicts what the glomerular filtration rate would be or how much fluid your kidneys are filtering every day. But they're not, it's not being measured, which is why it's called estimated. And it's important to know because many times we're asked, doctor, my EGFR is 60, um, you know, am I really sick? And I, my first response is, remember, it's just an estimated number. It comes back as 60, but it might be 80. So there's a big error associated with it. And to know what the true GFR is, and again, the GFR represents how much fluid is coming through your kidneys every day. To know what the true level is, we can't get it from measuring the creatinine. We have to do a more elaborate test, which really is not done anymore. Um, although there are newer things coming down the pipe, we're working on a new research project where we'll be able to actually measure the GFR. And my hope is that the, the term eGFR will end up in the dustbin. Um, it won't be used anymore. But until we have an FDA approved measurement for GFR, we're going to be left with this eGFR um, for probably a couple more years. But eventually, we'll get back to a measured GFR, and you'll know exactly what your GFR is. So again, creatinine is an indirect reflection of what your GFR is. And everybody on this call, whether you have kidney disease or not, should always know what your creatinine is because it's just a very quick and dirty way of knowing what the filtration ability of your kidneys are. And it's the filtration ability of your kidneys which determines whether you're gonna need dialysis or not. There's many other kidney functions that can decline, but they're not determinative of whether you need dialysis. It's the filtration ability, which is, a, which is something you need to focus on. Now, in addition to the creatinine, the doctor will also check your urine. So what are the things being checked for in the urine? One of the prominent things we check for is something else, not creatinine, but how much protein is in the urine? Because the normal kidney does not have any protein in the urine, very, very little. And so to the extent that the amount of protein increases and increases, you have more and more abnormalities with your kidneys. This does not reflect the filtration ability. It's a totally different parameter that we're assessing, but it does also reflect kidney disease. Now it's not determinative of whether you need dialysis or not. You can have a ton of protein in your urine. It has nothing to do with needing dialysis. That's the filtration ability that we discussed. However, this does reflect abnormal kidney, uh, not function, but abnormal parameter in the kidney because the kidney normally keeps the protein from getting in the urine. So it means there's some disease process going on. And we can assess this indirectly or not indirectly, directly, but not quantitatively by put using these dipsticks. And these dipsticks have different bars on them. 
And if there's more protein, you get a different bar turning color that you can read off the bottle. And if there's no protein, then you don't get the color changing. And so it gives you a guide as to whether there's a lot of protein or a little bit of protein or no protein. It doesn't tell you how much. To know how much protein is in the urine, we have to measure it directly. We have to send the urine to the lab. So if in the doctor's office we get that there's, there's protein in your urine, which is significant, the doctor will then take a sample of that, send it to the lab, and find out exactly how much protein is in the urine. The reason for showing this picture is protein in the urine is a cause for why there's bubbles in the urine. And so if you have a ton of bubbles and you're not peeing from too high above the water, which is the most common reason why there's bubbles, assuming it's not air from peeing way up above the water, um, if you're close to the water and you get this, you have to start thinking you might have protein in your urine. Now, something else which is never in the urine is blood. The kidney, even though it filters your blood, has mechanisms in the filters in the kidney that prevent blood from coming out in the toilet. However, if you have diseases of the kidney, we can start seeing blood in the urine. Now, again, this is another function of the kidney that has nothing to do with needing dialysis. That's, again, the filtration ability. However, if we see blood in the urine, just like if we see too much protein in the urine, it tells us that the kidney has something wrong with it and we have to work up the patient further. Now, we grade the blood by whether it's so-called macroscopic, which means you can see it with your own eyes, versus microscopic. So this urine uh, may be completely visually normal, but if we take it and look under the microscope, we may see a lot of red blood cells there, just not enough to turn the color red. So not only do we look at the urine with our eyes, we take a sample and we look under the microscope and we look for red blood cells. Now, another thing we do with the urine is look for bacteria because especially in sexually active young women in their 20s um, or 30s, they're prone to get urinary tract infections. And so because the urethra of a female is very short, uh, so men tend to not get uh, infections as, as often as women do. If we suspect an infection, the typical symptoms are I'm peeing more often, I have burning when I urinate. As soon as you hear that, you have to think of an infection. We'll look at the urine under the microscope, just like we'll look for blood. We also look for bacteria. And that's what you see here. There's many bacteria in the urine. There should never be any. Once we see that there's bacteria, we'll also do something called a culture. A culture means that we took a sample of that fluid and we put it on what's called an agar plate. This is just a plate that has a surface that the bacteria can grow on. And also there's food here for the bacteria. So if you have no bacteria, it'll look like this. It'll just be pink. If you have bacteria growing, you start getting these little colonies. The reason you get a colony is because there's one bacteria that divides into two, divides into four, divides into 16. Pretty soon, you get thousands of bacteria that form a little bump here. So if we see that, we know that the solution we put on the plate had bacteria. The second thing we do when we culture the urine is we have different antibiotics that we put here. Not shown here. There's no antibiotics here, but they look like little circles and they release antibiotics. And that's how the doctor can tell which antibiotic will work because if the antibiotic works, you'll see these things get killed. The problem with all this is it takes about 48 hours, 72 hours for these things to grow to, to where you can analyze them. And so the patient doesn't want to wait two or three days. So what the doctor will do if they see bacteria in the urine, or even if they don't see bacteria, but the patient's complaining of the appropriate symptoms like frequency of urinating and also burning, the doctor will just put you on an antibiotic and they'll guess which antibiotic to use. Now that antibiotic may be correct. In other words, the, from the culture report, that antibiotic was the right choice, which will be found out two to three days later, or the antibiotic is wrong, doctor puts you on an antibiotic that it wasn't sensitive to, in which case the doctor will switch the antibiotic. 
two to three days later. So what are some of the diseases that affect the kidney? Diabetes is a big one. It's a cause of about 50% of kidney disease. And it does two things. It destroys your blood vessels throughout your body. So it's not just a sugar problem. Plus, this is one of the filters in your kidney. There's a million of these in each of the kidneys. It ruins the filters. You can see this thing looks like it's all getting clogged up. This is another disease of the kidney where you have what's called, <coughs> excuse me, I have a bit of a cold, um, IgA, which is an, uh, an antibody, um, goes into the filter here and gets very, very inflamed. And blood comes into the urine. <coughs> Excuse me. This is another problem with the kidney where you can get kidney stones. And these stones look like any stones. And they can be in the kidney here. They can go into what's called the ureter. They can be, or they can actually come out if they're small enough. 15 million Americans have kidney stones. And the thing to know about kidney stones is if you have one that's trying to get out, but it's too big, you get severe, severe excruciating pain starting in your back and going around to the front, to the urethra. And this pain is worse than uh, having a baby. It's some of the worst pain a human being can experience. And these patients can be writhing on the floor. They need morphine often to stop the pain. This is another disease called polycystic kidney disease. It's a genetic disease where the kidneys are huge. And you can see they're not smooth. They have these blebs on them here, filled with blood. And these patients also can go on to dialysis. About 10% of people on dialysis have polycystic kidney disease. It's a genetic disease. This is a young girl who has what's called uh, lupus. You might've heard of lupus. It tends to occur in young women. And this is a normal filter in the kidney. This is one of this patient's filters. You can see it's filled with these black things. These are inflammatory cells. There's a ton of inflammation here in the filter and it just will stop working. And so the creatinine will go up and the EGFR will go down. And this patient may end up needing dialysis. This is what we call a malar rash. This is due to inflammation under the skin. It's, it looks like a sunburn, but it's not. And these patients can also lose their hair. They get inflammation throughout their body in different organs. They start attacking multiple organs, not just the kidney, and uh, can involve the brain, the heart, skin, joints. It's a systemic disease. This is cancer of the kidney. This is just a cartoon showing it here. And this is a normal kidney on a CAT scan. This is cancer in the other kidney. It's a pretty rare cancer. It's not common cancer. So just to give you some statistics, in the United States, there's about 650,000 patients on dialysis. And every year, about 100,000 new patients come on to dialysis and about 100,000 patients um, pass away every year. So the number stays around 650. I might add there's about 100,000 people in the United States also waiting for a kidney transplant. There just aren't enough organs to go around to get all these 650,000 people off dialysis. We have two forms of dialysis, hemodialysis, which requires needles stuck into what's called a shunt that's put in the arm, which is really um, a surgical procedure where the artery and vein are joined to each other to allow enough blood flow to come out into the machine through the vein, because we don't want to stick a needle in the artery. It's too high a pressure. The machine basically is just has a bunch of pumps. It's not a complicated machine. The key to the whole thing here is the dialyzer. So the blood comes in the bottom here. And then inside here, you can't see it. It just looks pink. But there's really thousands of little, you can think of them as straws, very thin straws. The blood comes in here and then gets distributed among all the little straws, goes through the inside, and then all the straws collect together, and then the blood comes out. It's actually called a hollow fiber kidney because it's made of thousands of hollow fibers, but you can just think of them as very thin straws. Well, how is that? We haven't done anything. We just have the blood coming in and the blood coming out. But the secret is 
outside the straws, we have another solution coming in. We have what's called a dialysate. We buy solutions from specific companies and we create the chemistry in those solutions that we need. And I'll explain what the thinking is in a minute. And that solution goes outside the straws and then comes out. Actually comes in here, counterflow. So the blood comes in and goes out here. The dialysate comes in the top and leaves the bottom. The dialysate never is recirculated. The blood keeps going around and around and around. This goes back to the patient and then out again. And this goes on for three and a half hours. Whereas the dialysate comes in and what comes out here in the blue just goes into the drain on the floor. So we never put the same dialysate in. And what we're doing here is we're putting a solution in that has different chemistry than the blood does. And what these hollow fibers do is allow different electrolytes or different poisons to come out of the blood into this solution that's on the outside that then goes into the floor. So we're tossing a solution that has all the electrolytes that we need to get rid of or the poisons we need to get rid of or water we need to get rid of. Because remember, these patients don't pee, most of them. So when they drink a liter today, they're going to gain a liter of fluid in their body. It's not going to come out. Whereas when you guys drink a liter, a liter comes out. Where you drink five liters, five liters comes out. If this gentleman drinks five liters, the five liter stays inside him. And he gains five kilo of weight because each liter weighs a kilo. It's roughly two and a half pounds, a little more. So we weigh these patients when they come in. And we know how much fluid we also have to remove here. So that's hemodialysis. It was invented in the 1940s in Nazi-occupied Netherlands. Uh, and then in the 50s became more commercially available throughout the world. The other form of dialysis is called peritoneal dialysis, which doesn't involve blood, doesn't involve needles, and doesn't involve having to go to a clinic three times a week. This is a... a methodology that came to the fore in the 70s, where you put this solution in, it's also called a dialysate, into a sac in your abdomen called the peritoneal cavity. Now, normally, this thing is collapsed like a balloon. If you don't put fluid in it, there's no, there's no cavity. It's like a collapsed balloon. But you can fill it with usually two liters of fluid, so a two-liter Coke bottle, and it'll expand. So we've got this now dialysate in here. But how are we cleaning the poisons from the patient's blood? How are we getting rid of electrolytes? Well, it turns out that this cavity is lined by your cells. And the poisons actually can cross from your blood, which is outside these cells, into the, into the solution if you wait long enough. And so we're using the cells as the dialyzer, unlike what I showed you before, that artificial hollow fiber. Uh, dialyzer. We're using your cells to transfer poisons and electrolytes from the blood into this solution. What we do at the end, we, we leave the solution in for two hours, and then we just drain it and put in a new solution. Now, this isn't done manually anymore. It's done usually with a machine while the patient's sleeping at night. And uh, we usually do five or maybe six two-hour exchanges. And then in the morning, the patient just uncaps the catheter here and goes about their business. And of course, at night, the converse, they hook themselves up. So peritoneal dialysis is really what the government and most nephrologists are pushing, just because it allows the patients to have more freedom. They're not tied down to a clinic. Number two, they don't have huge volumes of blood being taken out and removed because this is much more gentle. This is done over you know, this is done every day for, for seven days, whereas the hemodialysis, you do only three times a week, so it's much more aggressive. Um, whereas this is more gentle, but it's done more frequently. So this is what we try to get patients to do if they can. And then there's the kidney transplant. The kidney transplant that you see here, um, we're often asked, you know, what happens to the other kidneys? Well, the kidneys that aren't working, we leave in just because sometimes they're working a little bit and we wanna collect every little bit of urine we can to the extent that the kidneys are functioning, the transplanted kidney can fail a little bit and the patients are still okay. It's the total function we look at, the total filtration ability. So we never remove the native kidneys 
And then another key point is not only may the kidneys provide some filtration that are left there, but the kidneys also make a very important hormone. In fact, two very important hormones. One is called erythropoietin, and that's what tells the bone marrow to make your red blood cells. Remember I said before, when your kidneys don't work, you can get anemic. And that's because they don't make the erythropoietin hormone. Now the kidneys don't make the red blood cells, it's the bone marrow that does. But the, bone, but the erythropoietin from the kidney gets into the blood and tells the, your bones to make blood. And so that's that would be lost if we took the kidneys out. The other important hormone the kidney makes is the active form of vitamin D. When you go to the drugstore and buy vitamin D, that's not the active form. That's called 25-hydroxyl vitamin D. That chemical that you buy in the form of a pill or a vitamin has to be turned by the kidney into the active form. And so if we take the kidneys out, they can't make the active form and your vitamin D level drops and your bones can get into trouble. So for that reason, we leave the kidneys in. And then there's newer things occurring on the horizon, like xenotransplants, where, <coughs> excuse me, where we're looking to use pig kidneys in the future, uh, rather than human kidneys that won't get rejected. And that research is just starting. And then there's a lot of efforts to make an artificial kidney. We've been working on one at UCLA uh, for the last seven years or so, and we're getting much closer uh, to creating an artificial kidney. These will be adjunctive um, methodologies to treat people with end-stage renal disease. Not everybody will be able to get a human kidney or a xenotransplant in the future or an artificial kidney. So there'll always be room for dialysis, uh, but there'll be more choices in the future uh, for patients. And in addition, in the future, um, doctors will be more successful. Just go back to this slide here. Uh, oh, excuse me. going the wrong way, but that's okay. <laughs> Doctors will be uh, more successful at preventing um, the progression of CKD. So what happens is when you get, let, let's say you go to the doctor and they say you've got 60% of your kidney function and you're 50 years old, you have a real problem with your kidneys because that's lower than you should have for your age. What happens is, let's say you go back next year or the following year, you may have 40% of kidney function. There's a progression that sometimes occurs in people they can start off at CKD stage two, but two or three years later, there may be three, two or three years later, four, and different people progress at different rates. Some people just get stuck at one level and they're fine. But if the progression keeps occurring, you could end up on dialysis if it gets down to a very low level. And so there's a ton of effort, uh, both from uh, pharma and research labs everywhere to try to slow down the progression of the CKD stages, slow down the decline in the filtration of ability of the kidney, make it occur much more slow, slower. And because of that, you'll have less people than the 100,000 roughly every year in the US going onto dialysis. Maybe you'll have 70,000 or 50,000, that sort of thing. So not only, so the goal here is to prevent people from ever needing dialysis or renal replacement therapy in the first place. Um, but if they do end up needing renal replacement therapy, in the future, people will have uh, more choices, as I was alluding to. So I think I'll stop there, and I'd be glad to take uh, any questions uh, anyone might have regarding their own problems or kidney abnormalities in general. Does anyone have any anything they want to talk about? If you if you feel uncomfortable asking about personal medical things in public like this, um, Leslie has your email and you have hers, Leslie, my assistant, please feel free um, to uh, write her by email afterwards and we can set up a call uh, where we can do it more privately uh, if, if you wish to. I'd be glad to help all of you in any way I can. Uh, hi, doctor. My name is Cliff. Um, I have, uh, I spoke, I, I watched this uh, back on October 27th and I have one kidney. Uh, one was removed because of cancer of the ureter. Um, you made a comment. I believe you made a comment about the drinking water. And yes. I've heard so much about uh, trying to drink more water than 
I don't want to say normal, but trying to drink an awful lot of water, especially if, uh, those of us with just one kidney. Is that true? There's a lot of voodoo and a lot of confusing information. And most doctors don't know what the real answer is, but they tend by a sort of a knee jerk answer to say, just drink a lot of water. Very confusing for the patients because they don't know how much to drink or how little to drink. The answer is you, you need to be above a certain amount. And above that, your kidney is just going to get rid of it. So you're, and you're not going to, by drinking more, change the filtration ability of the kidney very much. The kidney will not, if, let, let, let's say, let's say the kidney is filtering 100 liters a day and you drink more water. You're not going to go to 120 or 130 liters a day. You're not, so you're not going to enhance your kidney's filtering ability significantly. That's the first thing. Number two, you're not going to, by doing that, prevent the kidney from declining in its function. No one's really ever shown that other than in specific situations, like if you have calcium stones and you have a ton of calcium in your urine, drinking more water will dilute the calcium and prevent you from having a stone, which can obstruct the kidney, that kind of thing. But in general, if you just have CKD, and by definition you do, if you have one kidney. Now remember, by the way, I think I mentioned it last time, when you remove a kidney, immediately you go to 50%, right? Because you had 100% before, that's just logic. Right. So if you were filtering, let's say 120 before, immediately you go to 60. But nature is clever. It causes the remaining kidney to actually grow and get bigger and filter more. And you can actually get back to 80 or 90% of your original filtration with one kidney, even though the, just because that remaining kidney um, is able to compensate. Now, not everybody compensates equally. It depends if you have how old you are, if you have any other underlying abnormalities like diabetes or high blood pressure, there's things that prevent the kidney from doing that. But in general, if you have nothing else going on and you're rather young when you had that kidney taken out, um, your other kidney can grow to quite an extent and compensate. So you don't have 50% of normal. You may have 80% of normal or 85% of normal. Um, could your creatinine actually get back down to one or one? Yeah, one of course. That's five? that. That's what happens if you do the experiment. So let's say I, I take out my kidney now and my creatinine is one. I take my kidney out tomorrow. My creatinine will immediately go to about two. And now I follow that creatinine uh, for the next year, year and a half. It will slowly go down as the kidney is filtering more. Because remember, it's an indirect reflection of the filtration ability. So it, as the filtration increases, it's inverse. So as the filtration increases, the, kid, the creatinine goes down, again, because you're able to excrete more creatinine. Um, so the blood level will drop. It may not get back to one, but it will get down lower than it was on the first day I had my kidney taken out. Right. So, but in, getting back to your question about water, um, what is important is not to go below a certain level. If you go below a certain level, um some people with kidney problems can get into trouble the normal kidney can get down to very low levels you can cut your water intake down to like one cup a day and your kidney will cut back its excretion to one cup a day and nothing will happen to you but certain people with kidney problems cannot cut back down so if you go below a certain amount your kidney may still be peeing out more than your intake and then you can get dehydrated but as long as you're above that level you have no problems at all. And so the bottom line is you should drink about a liter to two liters a day. I would not do more than that. All you're doing is making yourself urinate more. All the water you're taking in is just going into the toilet. You're not helping the function of your kidney unless you have calcium issues, as I mentioned, this, this sort of thing. But you certainly don't need to be drinking four or five liters a day. Now, I will add one little proviso. There was a study maybe 10 or 15 years ago where they just, and it wasn't a great study because it was retrospective, which means they looked at data that occurred in the past. Those studies are called retrospective. They're not as good as studies where you make a prediction and then follow patients into the future and see what happens. Studies where you look at data that occurred already are statistically not as um, precise, but be that as it may, they found that people that drink a ton of water a day, I think especially in the men, I may be wrong, but it was, I, think, I think it was men, 
uh, had less incidence of heart attacks. Had nothing to do with the kidneys. Um, whether it's truth or not, I don't know. I don't know of anyone who's repeated that work. Uh, but in the kidney world, you're going to get most nephrologists, most primary care doctors telling you to drink a lot, drink a lot, drink a lot. And it's there's no data that shows it makes any difference. Wow. Thank you. There was a good, I think, I, someone mentioned to me there was a great article on water intake in the New York Times. I don't read the New York Times, but um, I don't know if you read it, but it was like in the last two weeks, someone mentioned to me. Oh. Uh, you might want to look that up if you can. I will. I, I'd be interested if you do. Uh, write Leslie, we can talk about it. I'd like to know what you think about it. Okay. But it, it, it was, it, the, the person told me that it was one of the best articles ever written for the lay person on how much water you should drink. And again, it's, you know, it's a very controversial area. Um, doctor, I have a question if oh, you're- yes. Hi, Cindy, yeah. Hi, thank you, hi. Uh, you touched on a little bit on, uh, sorry, polycystic kidney disease on the uh, blood and the urine. And my question is, every time I exercise, I play competitive sport. And my first, when I first urine after I'm done exercising, it is pink or sometimes looks like uh, like a soda. Am I, should I be concerned about that? Do you have polycystic kidney? Y yes, I do. You do. Okay. Yes. Uh, do you, do you, what's your creatinine? I don't know. Uh, well, I haven't looked. My GFR is uh, like um, about 72. Okay. Again, that's an estimate. It could be nice. Yes. You know, yeah. you have to realize it. And do you have, do you mind if I ask how old you are? Yeah, I'm 62. Okay. Because typically people are pretty much okay. I mean, this again is an average until their 40s. Yeah. And, and the cysts start, you know, the those blebs that I showed about on that picture. Right. Uh, so is that what's bleeding then? Is that no, stressed? Uh, um, well, I'll, I'll, I'll just say it, it, it can occur without polycystic kidney disease. Uh, people who exercise can get more protein in the urine and sometimes they get a little bit of blood. It's because the, you during exercise, your blood pressure can go. I mean, I don't know what your blood pressure is. What is it? Yeah, it's 120 over. It, it's fine. It's, well, when you're running, you can go up to 200. Not you. Um, anybody. Yeah. Anyone. So when yeah. you're exercising, your people don't realize it, but your blood pressure goes high, and that's fine. You know, you don't okay. get in trouble with that. But that high pressure can drive more filtration through the kidneys. Uh, your eGFR actually goes higher when you exercise, and if yeah. you have any abnormalities in the kidney, you can get a yeah. little bit more blood or protein in the urine because of it. But exercise-induced uh, blood in the urine or protein in the urine in general is not anything to worry about. Okay. Uh, unless it okay. changes or gets excessive. The most important thing is that you keep your creatinine, uh, creatinine. whatever it is, 1.2, 1.3. Okay. Uh, and your I'll EGFR at, you know, 70 for the okay. rest of your life and you'll live till 120. Okay. Oh boy. <laughs> All right. Thank you very much. <laughs> Does anybody else have any questions or either about your own condition or things I wasn't clear about or in general about the kidney or about- Doctor, I have a question. Sure. I might. So I'm on uh, PD right now. The last checkup, they um, changed my um, uh, settings for the, for the dialysis during the night, but it seems that uh, it's taking out too much water. Well, that's interesting. Most people have the opposite problems. So. Yeah, it's- uh, Can I, can I ask how old you are? I'm 61. And how long have you been on dialysis? Since uh, February. And what do you? What's your routine? Five exchanges a night, six or four? It's four. Four two-hour exchanges. Yes. So for everybody who's not familiar, what this means is that when Michael's sleeping, hopefully sleeping, um, he, there's a little machine uh, that has the solution on it, and that machine puts in two liters. Let's stay in there for what two hours is the normal approximately yes yeah and then we'll drain that solution which contains the electrolytes and poisons that we want to get rid of and put a fresh solution in and it'll do that four times that's what we mean by four exchanges and one thing we look at is how much fluid is being removed because again do you, can I ask if you if you have any of your own urine or you don't not while I'm on I'm on it for five days 
the two days that I'm off, Saturday and Sunday, I do produce urine. And I do so during the week as well. Because, how much? Do you know how many cups? Um, Is it normal or significantly decreased? It's a, it's significantly decreased. Although I do go maybe three times a day, but it's... Okay. Not a lot of two, volume. Yeah, maybe it's 150, 200 milliliters. Yeah. So, so basically, uh, you know, assuming, so what we do is we, we try to figure out how much fluid we need to remove when we do this procedure. And we base it on, we take your intake, we roughly estimate how much fluid you're taking in, and it doesn't have to be water. It can be soup, coffee, even the fluid in food, all food, unless it's very dry, have some fluid. We take, try to get an estimate of that. Is it a liter, a liter and a half? And we subtract from that how much you urinate. And the rest must come out in the dialysis. So the urine plus the dialysis fluid removal has to equal your intake. If the dialysis plus the fluid removal is less than your intake, you're going to gain fluid and you're going to you know, get swollen feet and the rest of it. Whereas if we remove too much fluid on the dialysis compared to your intake, you're going to get dehydrated. So you know, we try to make the solution such that you're what's called imbalance. Your input and your output are equal. You're taking in roughly the amount of fluid that we're getting rid of. And we know that by the weight that we measure. When you measure your weight every morning after you go to the bathroom, you're really assessing your fluid balance. It's not really from your food. The weight from the food takes much longer to change. The daily changes in weight is basically fluid. Um, so if your weight goes up from, day to, from one day to the next, you gain fluid, essentially. Um, whereas if your weight drops, you've lost. So if your weight is the same every day, we know even without measuring anything that your input and output of fluid must be the same. Mm -hmm. So that's my next question. What's your weight doing? It's, uh, it's relatively stable within maybe three A pounds pound or two. less. Okay. But is it fluctuating up and down like the weather or is it trending in one direction? No, it's, it's pretty much staying the same. Okay. Uh, one, so 171. So if it's staying the same, it means that your input and output are the same. So no matter what you're measuring where you say it's more than it should be, um, if your weight is staying the same, then your intake and output are the same, I would not be concerned. However, if you tell me that your output is increasing and you don't like it, and then at the same time you tell me every couple of days you're measuring your weight and it's dropping, 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 yes, then I would say, we have two choices. We either have to decrease the amount of fluid we're removing, or we have to make you drink more. But you know, you can't be have that imbalance. So the weight is essential when you're on PD or dialysis. If your weight's staying the same, you're fine. So how much fluid comes off each time you do it? These are two liter bags. Three or, liters. No, it's it's it must be a six liter bag. Yeah, six, yeah, three liter each. Yeah. yeah three liter. Okay, yeah. So so how much fluid are you? So let's say you put in two liters, right? For one exchange. How mm -hmm. much fluid is coming off from a two liter? What do you take uh, off? A hundred? Well, um, 200? I know they, I know all the, I don't know the exact parameters of the program, but the, it used to be where they would leave some in or, or not um, drain all the bag itself out. But now with the new program, both bags are empty, completely empty. And then what's other strange thing is that the last dwell, I mean, uh, the last drain, um, even though it's programmed for whatever amount, I still have to manual drain. And it's like increased. Before it was like maybe 600, 500, something like that. But now it's like 2,300 milliliters taken out of the manual drain after the program drain. Yeah, but how much did the program take off? You see, see, typically, if you put two two thousand milliliters in, or, or two liters, which is roughly what we put in, roughly mm -hmm. equal to a Coke bottle, mm -hmm. you get out twenty one hundred. You know, you remove a hundred. You remove about a, a cup or two cups or three cups at the most. That's what each of those two liter exchanges do. You need to find out from your doctor or the nurse. You need to know how much fluid is each two liters that you're putting in removing. Yeah. And it's typically 100 or 150. In other words, if you put in a two liter solution, it would weigh two kilo on the scale. Mm -hmm. When you drained it, if it removed fluid from your body, it would typically weigh 2.1 kilo or 2.2 kilo. That's roughly two cups of fluid. That's what you need to know. 
Mm. And that's how much fluid total you're, you're removing. You don't include what you put in, you include the net. So if mm. you put in two liters and you removed 2.2 liters, that means you removed 0.2 liters. Mm. And that's what you need to know to, to address how much fluid is being removed. Uh, well, one of the things that's developed is uh, in the morning, um, I'm getting uh, cramps in my hands, spasms. Well, cramps on, in dialysis patients can be for many, many reasons. Mm -hmm. One is too much fluid is being re removed, which typically does not occur in peritoneal dialysis. It occurs in hemodialysis. Um, and it would be unusual for that. Another reason is electrolyte shifts. Common one is calcium. Um, I don't know if you take Tums or calcium pills. No. But you could take a, you, do you know what Tums are? Yes. Okay. You could take a half a Tums at night and see if that makes a difference or take one Tum, mm -hmm. you know, for a few nights in a row and see if they go away. If it goes away, you know, it's due to calcium shifting. It has nothing okay. to do with fluid removal. Mm -hmm. I heard uh, pickle juice. Say again, I'm sorry. I heard pickle juice. No, 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 no. That's it. No. No. Okay. No, just just take something real. Okay. Uh, just try a Tums. If you if it's predictable that you get the cramps, um, you know, night after night, try taking a Tums, uh, one Tums, the okay. larger one, the larger one, um, larger strength, uh, before you go to bed. Try it for two, three nights in a row, and then see if it goes away, do it, you know, repeat for two or three or four nights. So you do a good experiment and see if it really works. Okay. And if it goes away, and then when you stop the Tums, it comes back. Well, that's your answer. It's calcium. Okay. okay. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Anybody else have any worries or questions or things they want to discuss? Okay. Well, thank you all for joining tonight. If, if anything occurs to you afterwards, or you'd like to discuss some stuff in private, please reach out to Leslie, and I'd be glad to set up a time to go over. I, want, I have a question. I'm sorry, yeah, I was sure. mute. Sure. Yeah, okay. Bertha, is uh, that your name, Bertha? Yes, Bertha. Oh. Hi, Bertha. Uh, but, hi, doctor. Um, in September, <laughs> I went to, uh, to see my doctor, and he gave me a blood test. And then he said, um, uh, I was telling him that I get up to the bathroom too many times at night. So his, uh, the results of the blood test was, <clears throat> according to him, he said, it looks like that you have a urinary tract infection. So I, wanna, I want you to go for a culture. So I went and then uh, he said, uh, um, no, uh, it looks like that it's pretty clean. There is uh, no infection. So I'm sending you to the uh, to a urologist. Well, I have not been able to get a UCLA a urologist, but until February. So um, uh, should I be concerned about that? Because I get up to the bathroom sometimes how? seven times. Can I ask how old you are? 77. Okay, so there is an age dependent increase but you know seven times is more usually what i tell people is when you're 50 you get up one 60s twice 70s three times 80s four times unfortunately <clears throat> do you drink a lot of water yes yes how much water how much water are you drinking about 80 ounces a day 80 ounces how many glasses is that Eight, uh it will be uh, nine glasses why do you do that um, because if I don't, as the other gentleman was saying, I get a lot of cramps and, um, uh, but I do have a, a solution for cramps and is that, uh, uh, I take, uh, a little bit of tonic water, like a quarter of tonic water that has quinine and that helps me. You don't um, have, you don't have kidney disease, correct? You're no, I Okay. I don't think. So, so when do you get the cramps? In the middle of the night or during the day or any? Yeah, in the middle of the night. Where, Never where, the where day. are the cramps? Leg cramps? Leg cramps. Okay. Yes. Who, who told you to drink water to get rid of leg cramps? Uh, to drink regular, just water. 
yeah, um, you told me you drink, you know, a lot of water. I thought what you were saying was you do it because of you're trying to get rid of leg cramps. I'm wondering who told you to do that, or maybe uh, I misunderstood. No, no. Um, it also, it's also because if I don't drink enough water, I still get a lot, uh, get to the bathroom many times, and then I just go like a drop at a time. Uh, is I cannot release the the urine. I understand. Like well, there's sort of several issues here. Um, so just so I understand. You're not taking the water to get rid of cramps. Is that correct? You're taking the water no. so that you'll so that you'll urinate more. So that, that is correct. Yeah. Okay. So number one, the cramps are a separate issue. And again, the most common reason is calcium issues. And I recommend you take a Tums every night. See what happens. Okay. Just start taking Tums. Um, it's a good thing to do anyway, because women in their 60s start losing their bone mass. And you really should be taking one Tums every night. And the reason I say night is because you also can get the double benefit of getting rid of leg cramps, which is not uncommon. And the leg cramps tend to occur in the middle of the night. So if you take the Tums in the morning, it's not going to work because it'll be worn off by then. So take an extra strength Tums every night. See what happens to the leg cramps. Okay. Uh, but there number is another... two. Yeah, I just want to say number two. The, the treatment for not being able to get rid of all your urine is not to take more water. That is definitely not what you should be doing. Um, that's a separate problem. And taking more water is you're just driving the system. You're just putting more gas in the car and you're making the car go faster and faster and faster. You're just creating more urine that has to come out and you're going to just make yourself get up even more. Mm -hmm. Now, yes, I understand that more urine comes out and you feel you can empty yourself, but not being able to empty yourself completely or the sensation of not being able to empty yourself is not treated by taking in more water. That's not the right approach. So you should cut back, start cutting back on your water intake, and you should be drinking one or two liters a day. You know what a two liter Coke bottle looks like? Yes. Okay, you should be drinking maybe one to one and a half of those a day. I'm sure you'll be getting additional liquid from your soup. You'll be getting additional liquid from tea or coffee, um, etc. cetera. Okay. Cut back to that. Now, if you have these problems at night, one answer is not to drink so much in the evening. So after like three or four or five in the afternoon, you stop drinking. Certainly by okay. dinner time, no more drinking. See what happens. Now, if you still have to keep getting up and getting up and getting up. And you're frustrated because not enough urine is coming out. That's a separate issue. You may need to see a urologist. It could also be other issues that are causing it. The urologist may have nothing to do with urology. So that's what I would do first. Okay. Approach, um, it, log approach it logically and sequentially. Your cramps have nothing to do with any of this that we've talked about. That's a separate issue. Many women and men have cramps at night in their legs and tums can work wonders both in the kidney patient as i mentioned to the other gentleman and in people without kidney disease um, the other thing you can do for cramps at night is right before you go to bed you do squats you go up and down on your legs and exercise those muscles okay that also has been shown to decrease cramps and okay. so that with the tums will get hopefully get rid of the now it may not may not in you but try it Okay. Uh, as far as the water, cut back to a liter, liter and a half at the most. Don't okay. drink water after dinner uh -huh. and then see what happens. If you still have the issue, um, you know, and give it a month. If you still have the issue and you're still getting the urge to go throughout the night and not much urine is coming out, the likely thing is you don't have any urine to come out. So it's not that you got to get rid of urine. You don't have a lot there that needs to come out. And that's what's frustrating you, but that's not a problem. You don't treat that by drinking more water. You have to figure out why you're getting the urge so often when there's not urine there. That's the thing that has to be figured out by the doctors. Okay. But you don't try to make more urine so that every time you get the urge, you'll pee. You're just, yeah, that's a vicious circle you're creating. Now, why you might get the urge more often, even though you don't need to go much, has many, many causes from infection that you mentioned, to problems with your bladder, to nerve problems going into your bladder, all sorts of 
medical issues can give you the give your brain the sensation you have to pee when you don't really have to and that needs to be worked out whether it's a neurologist or whether it's a urologist that'll be worked out later first see what happens when you cut back on the intake do you mm -hmm. the key question is do you still have this sensation that you have to go to the bathroom even when you don't have to okay uh, doctor, another thing that I notice, if I do not drink enough water, my blood pressure goes up. Well, what's your normal blood pressure? Uh, normally, it's in between uh, um, uh, 130 over 80, 80 to 85, something like that, or lower. And when you don't drink when you don't drink, your blood pressure goes to what? It goes to 140, 150. How soon after? When does that happen? Just all day or like, let's say, oh, let's say tomorrow you, you, you measure it in the morning and it's 130 and then you don't have any water till let's say dinner time. Is your pressure going to already be up by dinner? Oh, I don't know. I never tried that too. But, but how do you know it's up then? How soon after you stop drinking does it go up? That's a key thing to know does it occur no, uh, immediately, uh, immediately or it takes days to happen uh, at night um at night i measure my blood pressure and if i have not drunk uh for instance uh like uh, at least uh, 60 uh, or eight glasses my blood pressure is up mm -hmm. well you have to realize also there's a normal variation in blood pressure from morning to afternoon to night to the middle of the night you never get the same number. So the first thing you really have to do is measure your blood pressures and get a real feel for what the, the changes are for you throughout the 20. It's called the diurnal variation. Every human being has a pattern of blood pressures throughout the day and at night. Now, you don't have to get up in the middle of the night to do it, but you should measure your pressure in the morning, the afternoon, and at night for about two weeks and see what the average is. Is it high in the morning? Is it low in the morning and high at night, different people are different, but there will be a pattern that's repeatable. It won't be random. Okay. So you'll get your pattern and you have to learn your pattern first. Once you know your pattern, then you can do your experiment of drinking and see if it makes a difference. But right now you need to know if what you're talking about is just not the normal diurnal variation of blood pressure, because it's not the same in the morning and at night in anybody. In fact, right. it starts to drop uh, in many people at night and starts climbing again three or four in the morning such that in the morning it's you know four or five in the morning it's the highest then it starts to come down again in the afternoon other people are different and it okay. depends if you have hot but you need to know what your normal pattern is before you start trying to change it because what you're talking about may just be totally normality now there are specific conditions where if you take in more fluid your blood pressure can actually go down. But those are people usually with problems with the arteries going into the kidney and the, the, kid, the arteries make a hormone called renin and you can get this. Because normally in a normal person, you take in more fluid, your blood pressure goes up, not down. That would be the normal response. In fact, that's how we treat people whose blood pressure is very low. We tell them to drink salt water or we okay. give them tomato, tomato juice has a lot of salt in it. So they don't have to have the horrible taste of salt water they just drink tomato juice very high salt content tomato juice very nice way to raise your blood pressure but you're talking about the opposite where you drink fluid and you have this paradoxical decrease and again we see that but it's not common and i don't i doubt very much you have uh, renal artery issues so i for the blood pressure the first thing you have to do is define over two weeks measuring it every day your pattern and get a real feel to what your pressures do throughout the day. And once you know that, then you can do the experiment of altering your fluid intake if you want in the morning or the afternoon or, and see if anything changes. Okay. If, something, if something changes, then yes, you have a, a fluid-induced change in the pressure, but typically it would go up when you drink, not down. So the fact that it goes down is not, not typical. Oh, okay, very good. Thank you very much, doctor. Yeah, yeah. Oh, the other thing, by the way, is make sure you have a blood pressure cuff, which is accurate, because anyone who's assessing their blood pressure, you need to know that your cuff is giving you a real reliable reading. 
because if it's not, you're making decisions based on poor data. And the only way you can know if your cuff is giving you reliable readings is to take it into the doctor whenever you have a doctor's appointment and make sure that you're getting roughly the same measurements that the doctor got in their office. So yeah, we, you should you should be taking your cuff in. I don't know how often you see doctors, but at least twice a year, you should get your blood pressure cuff checked. Uh -huh. Okay. Uh, yeah, um, we have the uh, the little machine, and uh, um, my husband goes to a cardiologist, and we took it to him, and they calibrated it, and he said it's okay. It's um, yeah, they don't they don't actually calibrate it; they just check it. There's no real good way to calibrate it. They don't change the readings. They just tell you if they got the same reading as their machine. Uh -huh. they, can't, okay. they can't. They can't make it better if it's if it's giving wrong readings. You have to get a new one. Okay. Okay. Very but good. you know they're cheap. They're 50, 60 bucks. Yeah. 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 This one that I have is basically new. Uh, is, it the, an, is it an Omicron? Yes. Omicrons are very good. Yeah, it's Omicron. Yeah, very good. Okay. All right. Thank you so much, doctor. Yeah, no problem. Good luck with everything. Thank you. Appreciate it. Anyone else have any questions? Okay. Well, I think um, we'll call it a night. And again, thank you for joining the uh, the Q and A. Uh, and reach out to Leslie if you have any further questions or worries. Be glad to get back to you and discuss it privately. Thank you for your time, doctor. Thank, thank you, doctor. You. Thank you so much. Bye, bye, everybody. Bye, bye.